الله بالخير عن رصاص واشنطن الذي اغتال العمليات الديمقراطية والثورات والأمل كتب المؤرخ الهندي في جي براشاد وكشف الكثير عن تاريخ المخابرات المركزية الأمريكية CIA والانقلابات والاغتيالات في أفريقيا وآسيا وأمريكا اللاتينية منذ الحرب العالمية الأولى كيف روعت أمريكا الشعوب الأصلية وسلبتها ثرواتها بذريعة أنها غير متحضرة من الحرب الباردة إلى الحروب بالوكالة رصاص واشنطن في أوكرانيا وتايوان هل أصاب حلفاء أمريكا بدلا من روسيا؟ مارد البريكس خرج من قمقم الجنوب العالمي فمتى تنحسر هيمنة الشمال العالمي؟ حروب باسم ما يسمى الديمقراطية هل باتت الحرب على الصين قاب قوسين أو أدنى؟ نرحب بكم ونرى ونسمع أكثر من ضيفنا في جي براشاد المؤرخ والكاتب الهندي في البعد الأقرب هذه الميادين وأنا زينب صفار خليكم ويانا في جي براشاد American based Indian historian and author executive director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research Advisory Board Member of the U.S. Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, authored, among many other books, Washington Bullets, A History of the CIA Coups and Assassinations. Vijay Prashad, salam and welcome to Al Mayadeen. This is The Proximate Aspect. I'm Zainab Al Safar. Such a pleasure to have you, Vijay. Salam to you. It's great to be with you. Always welcome. Well, um, your book, Washington Bullets, A History of the CIA Coups and Assassinations, is based on a vast amount of reading of U.S. government documents and documents from its allied governments and uh, multilateral organizations. What are the bottom lines, VJ? You see, before World War II, much of the world had been formal colonies. So then... Western countries didn't need to come in and coup a government or they didn't need to come in and assassinate uh, leaders. They dominated the world. But after World War II, as countries began to chart a path of independence, countries, for instance, like Guatemala or mm -hmm. Iran, when they tried to move a path of independence, this was seen as completely unacceptable um, to the former colonial powers, Great Britain, France, and so on, and also the new giant on the world stage, the United States. And that's why right after World War II, we have this coup in Iran in 1953 mm -hmm. against the democratically elected government Musabda. of Mohammed Mossadegh. Mm -hmm. And then in 1954, there's a coup in Guatemala against the democratically elected government of Jacob Arbenz. And let me just say for the record, Nobody denies the fact that the British government and the U.S. government conducted these coups against the governments of Iran and Guatemala. There is no debate. Mm -hmm. There is no discussion. In fact, the records of the coup making are available publicly right. from the Central Intelligence Agency in yes. Washington. But and so v v there's no discussion here. Sure, know. but did you find an answer to your question as of why did the U.S. administrations, consecutive administrations, do so? Yes, exactly. Precisely. Um, when you look at the coup 50 years ago 
against the democratically elected government of Salvador Allende in Chile. Mm-hmm. That coup and the records on that coup give you precisely the answer. In other words, um, Salvador Allende was leading the popular unity government, which decided that, look, the copper under the ground in Chile is the copper of the people of Chile, much like the oil under the ground in Iran was the oil of the Iranian people or the agricultural lands of Guatemala were the property of the people of Guatemala. So the government of Allende decided we're going to nationalize the copper, but more than that, we're going to use the um, excess profits that had been taken by U.S. corporations in previous decades Mm -hmm. and use those excess profits as a way to say, look, in fact, we don't owe you money for expropriating your company. You owe us compensation for those excess profits. Well, this was a model that Henry Kissinger, National Security Advisor of the U.S. government, Richard Nixon, President of the United States, they found it unacceptable to Mm -hmm. allow Chile to become a model for a dignified sovereign country. Mm -hmm. And it was to prevent that model from existing in the world that the United States quite openly said first, we're going to make the economy scream. That's a line from Richard Nixon. And then we're going to just suffocate the country and conduct the coup 50 years ago, led by General Augusto Pinochet um, in Chile. And you see, there are example upon examples of this, including recently the coup against the government of Evo Morales um, in Bolivia, the coup against the government of Pedro Castillo in Peru, and of course the attempt to overthrow the governments in Iran, in Syria, in Cuba, in Venezuela, and so on. Allow me here to say something, Vijay, that in the days of colonialism, if a colonial power wanted to invade a territory, it could do so at uh, its own will. Uh, This is very true. Other colonial powers could object, and sometimes did actually so but this objection did not come on behalf of those who were being overrun it came out of the competitive feeling between colonial powers right can you explain that further please so 200 years ago this year in 1823 a u.s president articulated a doctrine called the monroe doctrine Mm -hmm. what james monroe said was He said the Americas, all the way from, um, you know, the North Pole down to the southern tip of Argentina and Chile, that entire hemisphere is effectively the dominion of the United States, that Europe must not be permitted to interfere in the Americas. In other words, what the United States was saying was not that we stand in solidarity with the people of, you know, Grand Bolivia led by Simon Bolivar or the the people led by San Martin, uh, people led by O'Higgins in Chile. No, no. Um, The Monroe Doctrine isn't saying that all peoples of the America should be sovereign from colonialism. What the Monroe Doctrine said was, hey, listen, Europeans, you stick to that part of the world. Go colonize Asia and Africa. The Americas, that's for the United States. So yes, the colonial powers did compete with each other, but there was no principle anti-colonialism in some of these uh, clashes that they had between each other. Mm -hmm. In fact, the opposite, they were trying to carve up the world. In 1885, Western countries gathered in Berlin, sat down with a giant map of Africa and just carved out the territory saying, you know, this is for Germany, um, this is for Britain, this is for France. That was called the scramble for Africa. I mean, can you imagine human beings sitting there on a map and saying, that's mine? To add pain to injury, uh, VJ, John Westlake, the Cambridge University professor who pioneered international law, wrote in his 1894 textbook, uh, which is titled International Law, that in order to protect the natives, they must give up their land and resources to the colonizers who must themselves come to an understanding through international law so that they do not go to war with each other. So it is to the benefit of the natives uh, 
that they surrender and watch the imperialists divide up the loot. That's the highest point of imperialist international law, which burrows itself into the conceptual framework of present-day international laws. Is the international humanitarian law, is it just an extension of the imperialist colonial law? Well, let me say two things about that. Firstly, yes, when the um, great powers gathered together to create the responsibility to protect doctrine under the auspices of the United Nations in 2006, they were um, reacting to the fact that the United States illegal war on Iraq had in fact dented the legitimacy of international law and of Western intervention. So they came together and they concocted a theory of the responsibility to protect a very paternalist doctrine that assumes that peoples of the South don't have the capacity, despite the great pain of struggles that take place in the South, there was a claim they don't have the capacity to take care of themselves. They need intervention from the West. They need the school teacher to enter the playground and separate each other. It's a very paternalist attitude toward the world. But around uh, just a few years later, the United States and France decided to bomb Libya in 2011. It's very interesting uh, because this was the 100th anniversary of the first major aerial bombardment of a country in 1911. Italy bombed Libya. It was the first major aerial bombardment and the Italians wrote about that bombardment saying, we have to bomb them from the air with immense force. Why? Because we need to teach the natives, we need to teach the savages to be afraid of us. And if they fear us, then they will obey us. And if they obey us, they can become modern. That attitude, by the way, from 1911 in the bombing against Libya was absolutely identical to the bombing by NATO of Libya in 2011. There's an attitude. The natives must fear the West. And if they fear the West, they will obey the West. Mm -hmm. If they obey the West, they can become modern. It's sure. not only paternalistic, it's racist. Right. Now, uh, today, uh, Vijay, the majority of the world, the global South, now faces a US-led and dominated imperialist system that is rooted in an integrated military uh, structure uh, supported by the industrial military complex. Well, this system is composed of three groups, as we all know. Number one, the USA, the UK, and other Anglo-American white settler states. Number two, Europe. And number three, Japan. The global north is home to a minority of the world's population, which is around 14.2%, but is responsible for a clear majority of global military spending, around 66%. Is it this immense military power that allows the triad to continue to assert itself over the world's peoples, despite its weakening hold on the world economy today, Vijay? Well, that's an interesting point. Firstly, this concept, the triad, it's an absolutely essential concept to understand the world today. You know, generally people think, well, the United States is operating, um, you know, as a kind of international bully. You know, it's the U.S. It kind of bullies Europe to go along with it. Occasionally you'll have Emmanuel Macron saying, you know, we don't want um, to follow the United States. Or in 2019, Mr. Macron, as president of France, said that NATO is brain dead. You know, people exaggerate the differences between Europe and the United States or Japan and the United States. In fact, these three zones of the world, the United States with Canada, Europe and Japan operate together. And if we see the way they operate together, when push comes to shove, um, you won't be surprised by the kind of world they've created. You know, right now there's a war on in Ukraine. Until recently, France said, look, Ukraine shouldn't join uh, NATO, that, that's, you know, too much of a um, provocation against Russia. Well, in the middle of this conflict, pressure comes from Washington and Emmanuel Macron uh, at the GlobeSec conference a few months ago says, well, no, um, NATO and Ukraine have a relationship with each other and we think there should be a path for, for NATO membership for Ukraine. 
You know, mm-hmm. this is extraordinarily provocative in the middle of a war. Um, and yet you see France, Japan and so on quite cavalierly standing toe to toe with the United States, which has been pushing a very destructive policy on the world, you know, not only provoking Russia into a open conflict, but provoking sure. China, which would be catastrophic. On this At particular, same- yes, on this particular issue, Vijay, several European states are uneasy about the domestic economic consequences of prolonging the war in Ukraine and of a possible confrontation and military conflict over Taiwan. Is it uh, perhaps this uneasiness that prompted U.S. President Joe Biden to say, uh, quote, we're not looking to decouple from China, we're looking to de-risk and diversify our relationship uh, with China. What does that mean? What's your sense, Vijay? It's an interesting comment made by Biden because Joe Biden said, Look, we want to de-risk. We want to um, settle our problem here. But in fact, that was duplicitous. Yes, Biden was referring to the unease in the triad partners. There's a lot of unease. But let's say a couple of things. One, you know, the triad partners might understand the actual negative impact of this conflict Uh, First, against Russia, NATO's conflict against Russia. And then second, this evolving and dangerous confrontation with China. Europeans understand that they are paying a negative cost for this confrontation. But none of the European leaders have the kind of political confidence, the backing of their elites, to come out there and publicly denounce the United States um, for provoking first Russia and then China. None of them. They're just uneasy. I mean, I I like the way you use the word unease. By the way, 97% of the um, hard weaponry entering Ukraine is entering from NATO countries. Ukrainian soldiers are being trained in NATO countries, including the United Kingdom, in Poland, in in Germany, and so on. So it's not like NATO is not in this war. It's not formally in this war. But this is a confrontation between NATO and Russia with Ukraine as the proxy. That's sure. something that the European elites are not willing to recognize. Right, from the Cold War to the different various consecutive uh, proxy wars. Now, a recent meeting, VJ of foreign ministers of the BRICS Plus Group of Nations in South Africa uh, has called for a rebalancing of the global order away from Western nations. The talks proceed, of course, ahead of state summit in uh, August. Can BRICS nations be the symbol of change? Well, look, I very much hope that the BRICS countries, not only at the South Africa summit in August, but in the years to come, I very much hope that they'll be able to chart uh, a course towards what they are calling rebalancing. It's absolutely necessary. You know, the fact that China took a peace agreement, 12 point you know, at least principles for a peace conversation to Ukraine and to Russia is a really important sign. The fact that Saudi Arabia and Iran met in in, in, um, in, 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 in China. China and had a conversation about opening up a grand bargain or at least having some sort of modus vivendi. It's a very positive sign forward. The role of President Lula of Brazil traveling around the world and talking about peace. I mean, I am extremely hopeful Mm -hmm. that if the BRICS countries can hold it together in August in South Africa and then in subsequent years and come to the table, international table, United Nations and so on and say, look, enough is enough, fellas. These wars cannot continue. I'm hopeful as well that Mm -hmm. this year at the UN General Assembly, the South Africans will table a resolution about the Palestinian Um, you know, liberation struggle. It's about time that we stood up and said, enough, you know, we're not going to tolerate this anymore. Mm -hmm. There's news coming now from Israel that the Israeli government is going to pass a bill that won't allow Palestinians to rent properties in so-called Jewish areas. I mean, how can anybody deny that that's apartheid? And apartheid is illegal. And therefore, Israel is conducting one illegality after another. And yet, the so-called big boys at the table, the triad countries, completely oblivious, backing Israel, allowing it with complete impunity to do what it wants. So I'm hopeful that the BRICS countries 
not only will chart a path, say, for peace in Ukraine to dial down the tensions around Taiwan, but also deal with long-standing problems like the issue of um, the emancipation of the Palestinians. Sure, sure. Hopefully. In talking about hope, VJ, Latin America is changing. For the first time ever, the largest economies in Latin America will now all be governed by progressive politicians who are increasingly hostile to U.S. influence in the hemisphere while embracing economic, political and military ties with China. Definitely a clear indication of the region-wide rejection of U.S. policies. The U.S. cannot ignore this new pink tide in Latin America. Do you agree, uh, VJ? And might you explain why did neoliberalism fail in the Global South and what pushes the Global South more and more towards China? Well, firstly, neoliberalism failed because neoliberalism is a failure. You know, it doesn't know how to deal with the basic questions of social welfare of sure. the population. You know, people want health care, people want education, people want the best for their families and communities. And neoliberalism essentially is a form of social cannibalism. That's what it is. It's going, it is failing all over the world. Mm -hmm. But let's broaden the lens out of Latin America. In fact, I would say that there's a shift of mood in the entirety of the global south, uh, whether the governments are directly progressive or not. You see, the shift is interesting. We can call it the new non-alignment. What we're seeing is governments are saying, listen, you know, previously we used to accept the United States at its word. When the U.S. government would say, this is the universal interest, you know, this is something good for the planet, we accepted it. We said, okay. But then over time, we realized that what they were selling as the universal interest or as the international interest was, in fact, a parochial interest of the United States, in fact, just of its elites, that we want to stand up for our national interests. So even a country like India, you have now India saying to the United States, look, Listen, you know, we generally are pro-US. That's the Modi government, the government of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Generally, we are pro. But we are not going to cut our oil purchases from Russia, natural gas purchases from Russia. We're not going to supply weapons to Ukraine. In fact, we're going to buy weapons from Russia. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you see this new mood of what we are calling the new non-alignment. This is there in Brazil. Uh, this is there in India, it's there in South Africa. In fact, it's there in the BRICS countries. Mm -hmm. And also Mexico, Indonesia, large countries which are saying, we're not going to, you know, any longer sit back and say, whatever Washington says, we will do. Why it's not entirely pink is that we are struggling around the world um, with information unevenness. You know, al Mahdin is part of this. For instance, despite the fact that al Mahdin exists, or despite the fact that Telesur exists, or despite the fact that there are other, you know, uh, media outlets around the world that don't toe the line from Reuters, Associated Press, New York Times, CNN, and so on. Despite that fact, these Western media outlets continue to have an overwhelming power over the communications order. So even in our own countries, people sometimes get the news about themselves coming from Washington or coming from London or coming from Paris. And sure. so therefore, even underneath these governments that are saying, hey, listen, we want a new non-alignment. There are publics beneath them who believe what is coming from the West. And this communication struggle, that's a really serious issue. How You've got to decolonize the information order. Sure. However, as the Guatemalan poet uh, once said, uh, the most beautiful thing for those who have fought a whole life is to come to the end and say, we believed in people and life, and life and the people never let us down. Vijay Prashad, Indian historian and author, thank you very much, sir, for sharing your interesting thoughts. Always a pleasure to have you, Vijay. Thanks a lot. Thanks. إذن الإمبريالية هي وحش يهيمن على الشعوب ويخضعها ويلتهم مواردها الطبيعية وأيديها العاملة وثرواتها ولعل أي شخص قد ينكر الفحش المطلق للإمبريالية يجد إجابة واقعية لحقيقة دامغة
لماذا لدى أغنى 22 رجلا في العالم ثروة أكثر من جميع النساء في أفريقيا؟ أو كيف أن نسبة 1% لديهم أكثر من ضعف ثروة نحو 7 مليارات شخص؟ على من يتنكر لهذا الواقع المجحف والمرير أن تكون لديه إجابة واضحة عن سبب استمرار معاناتنا من الجوع والأمية والأسقام والإذلال بمختلف أنواعه وأوجهه لكن ألا تشير إرهاصات المتغيرات العالمية اليوم واضمحلال وأفول الهيمنة الأمريكية إلى قرب خلاص الإنسانية من عتو ووحشية الأحادية والإمبريالية ورصاصها السام ضد شعوب العالم من كل الميادين سلاما وتحية في مالا